So today's topic is buying black the block the block. Um, the importance of real estate investing and the importance of what we can do in our own communities. So I put together a presentation that I'm gonna share with you all that will walk you through the important steps. Let's see, let me share the screen and we will start the slideshow from the beginning. Okay. This box. Yeah. Okay. So buying back the block. Okay, the vision and the key takeaways of this. Real estate is a tangible asset that will always be in demand. That means, you know, when you're thinking about what you want to invest in, you want something that is actually physically there. Um, when you can invest in other things like stocks, which are pieces of paper that represent a portion of a company. But if that company goes away, then the value of that stock goes away. Whereas with real estate, uh, it's always going to have some value. Land is always going to have value. They're not making more land. Um, and everyone must live somewhere. And someone has to own every single place someone lives. Another important thing you have to think about with real estate is it allows you to leverage the money that you've worked hard for. So when you have a job, when, even when you, ha when you have a degree and you get a job, if you stop working, you stop producing money. Okay. With real estate, once you own the real estate, it can continue to make money for you, whether you're working or not. And most people don't realize that real estate is literally the oldest business in the world. Even kingdoms were built on real estate. The king had the wealth because he owned all of the land and he collected tariffs, which are taxes, and he had lords in different areas that were just like counties, and they were collecting revenue, and that's how the kingdom functioned. So to this day, the city government, state government, still uses that same model. Okay, so that's how you, that's how we we uh, we fund schools, we fund the the police, everything is funded through real estate and property taxes. Okay, so like I said the reasons why you need to be active in real estate someone owns every home or every building you pass every day when you're going to work you probably pass hundreds of buildings somebody owns each and every one of those and other people are tenants of those okay so when you control real estate you have a stake in that game so what usually happens is in areas where we are not active in real estate especially in our neighborhoods they it starts off with neglect and then it evolves into gentrification because people from outside of the community come in and do what they want with the community. And we need, we definitely need to take that power back. Okay. So this is the, the leverage part is what I was talking about earlier, where you make a decision once for real estate and it continues to pay you. Okay. So instead of submitting resume, you know, going through a job, spending your time, your energy, and your knowledge, you can invest money that you've already made and you use sound investing principles to generate cash flow. And you also get an increase in your net worth as the equity builds up in the property, which means as the property value goes up. This is called leverage. You are leveraging um, the asset, you are leveraging time, and you are leveraging your money to make money for you without you having to continue to work for it. Okay, so like I said, that's the difference. This isn't a job where you must have to prove how much you know or you don't have to do it all on your own either. That's the great thing about this. This is an industry where there's experts around you. There's people like myself that have been active in real estate for over a decade. And I'm here giving guidance and showing you how you can participate in the real estate game. Okay. So there are several ways to invest into and to participate in real estate and buy the block. Some of them are more passive routes than others. So we'll go through some of those. Okay. So a couple of these are very active ways to invest. The flipping houses is where you buy a house below market value that needs work, you renovate it, and then you sell it for a profit above what you spent. That's technically not buying the block. Um, that's, that's just trading real estate. So you, you, you're, trading, um, and you, you're trading a lower end investment and fixing it up and then selling it, which is the other end of a trade uh, to make a profit, okay? Wholesaling is the same thing. Wholesaling is when you find properties that need work 
And instead of you actually doing the rehab yourself, you get them on the contract and then you allow an investor to buy it from you. And so, you know, you're not actually doing any work, but you make money. You don't actually own anything long-term. So the second you stop flipping or wholesaling, you stop making money. Now, new construction, it, it can fit both parameters. Okay. If you're going to, if you're going to be building new construction to sell, then that's an active way to be involved in um, buying the block. Um, but it's, it's short term as well, because you're going to probably buy raw land. You're going to hold it for a while. You're going to develop it, build new construction on it, and then you sell and then you have to repeat that process. Um, so the only way that um, new construction can be an actual uh, process where you're buying the block is if you're actually going to build it and keep it as a rental property, which goes to the next two points. So owning residential real estate, as passive income, um, owning commercial real estate, which is instead of leasing to an individual person, you're leasing to a business of any type from retail to a restaurant to office space. Um, it can even be uh, like storage buildings. Um, all of those things are commercial real estate and those can be rental properties. And once again, that you see these things everywhere. So this is something that we all need to be participating in. Okay, house hacking is a passive form of real estate. Uh, and let me let me give you the difference. So active is the first three where you're actually having to do something over and over and over in order to continue to generate revenue. Passive is the more leveraged side of real estate where you're investing one time and it's paying you over and over and over. OK, so house hacking is a term that's used in the real estate community for people that buy a multi unit home. So that's like a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, and you live in one unit and then you rent out the rest of the units. So what that does is you get rental revenue from the other units that usually covers and exceeds your mortgage payment. So that makes profit for you. Okay, another way is if you don't want to do any of this individually, you can join an investment pool where people collectively are making decisions. I, I don't suggest getting into a pool with a bunch of novice um, investors where there's no one with the experience. I highly suggest you have somebody on the team that's got some real um, heavy experience in real estate, you know, knows what not to do, knows how to look for the signs of what good investments are. And, you know, uh, I would say partner with that person and you can build a group around them and y'all can collectively invest. And that's passive because you're just putting money in and you're getting returns for that. Another way that you can be involved is to actually lend money to other investors. So this is a way for you to fuel buying back the block without actually being the person that owns the real estate. Owning real estate really isn't for everyone. There's nothing wrong with that, but you can still participate and you can be the catalyst for redevelopment in the communities for the acquisition of properties just by being the lender on deals. So it could be short term where you are um, lending someone money to rehab a house. And then once they finish the rehab, uh, they can refinance and get enough from the bank to pay you off. They can sell the house um, and pay you off. And sometimes you can just keep, give them a long-term loan where it's 20 or 30 year loan and they're paying you consistently for the next 20 or 30 years until they pay the balance off that they paid you. I mean, they, they borrowed from you. And of course, the last one uh, with buying back the block is home ownership. Now your primary residence is not always going to be an investment where it's going to give you a positive return because, you know, if the, the, true, the, the true determination of something being an investment or not is if you make more money than it costs you, okay? So when you own your primary residence, you have to think about every expense associated with that house from insurance to taxes, uh, to maintenance, you know, yard work, HOA fees, um, any repairs that you have to make on that home. If you, if you add up all of those things and then the value appreciation of that house for that year is higher than all of those expenses together, that has become a profitable investment. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a home as your primary residence that you do not you know, exceed that. That's just a preference. You know, some people like to rent, some people like to own. But um, one, that's one misnomer that we always, that we have a lot in our communities because if simply owning a home was an investment, there would be no foreclosures, okay? But yet every year there are tons of foreclosures from people that bought the wrong home or couldn't afford the home after a while or lost a job, where if, had they been renting, they would not have a foreclosure on their credit. So there's a lot of 
there's a lot of positive and negatives that people really have to think about when it comes to your primary residence. But that is definitely a way to buy the block. If you are buying in an area that's gentrifying, it's highly likely that that primary residence will be an investment because the property values go up a lot faster in the areas that are gentrifying because the property values have been suppressed for a very long time. And once that revitalization starts, the demand for that market is very high. And uh, as people compete to get in that new market, the property values go up. And every time somebody buys a new house and they offer a 5,000 above the last house or 10,000 above the last house that's sold, that goes directly to the amount of value your property has. Because uh, an appraisal is based on the, the three like kind sales, the three most recent sales of a house that's as close to yours as possible. So every time one of those sales that, that keeps bringing the average up higher and higher. And that's what, make your, that's what makes your primary residence truly an investment. Okay, so the importance of us being active in buying the block collectively without having to wait is that we have the power within our community to do these things. We don't have to wait for politicians. We don't have to wait for Mayor Turner here in Houston. We don't have to wait for Oprah. We don't have to be mad at LeBron James because he's not taking all his money and investing because we collectively have trillions of dollars that circulate in our community. And if we pool what we have, we can collectively buy assets, buy houses, make investments in our communities, improve our communities, uh, protect the existing residents in our communities, because if we own the real estate, we control the rents. So when these areas do start gentrifying and revitalizing, we are in control of the narrative and we still get the benefit from all the value appreciation. Everything has a life cycle, including a neighborhood, okay? So we need to bring our neighborhoods back to life. It's great and it's, novel, it's noble to say that we want to protect the existing residents, and we have to do that. But outside of that, we have to bring the higher incomes back to our communities. See, before the civil rights movement, before desegregation, everybody lived in these communities because we were confined to them. So the doctors, the lawyers, uh, everybody, the, the business owners, you know, the business owners who, who hired people that worked in the community well, before we needed affirmative action because we owned all of our own businesses. All of that was in that one neighborhood. And unfortunately now, uh, a lot of us moved out of those neighborhoods when we felt like we, we no longer had, the, had those confines on us, right? So when you move to the suburbs and you move to other places and you leave no one but the low income people there, then that changes the whole demographic of the community. That, that changes who lives there that changes what kind of businesses can be supported because the people there can't really afford them anymore. And then what happens is that narrative kind of turns and in, turns into, well, let's protect them. Let's leave them, you know, let, let's look after them and let's not do anything. But when we don't do anything, the grocery stores will never want to come back because no one over there has the income to support the grocery stores. The small businesses that start up there won't survive because the people there can't uh, afford it. So we have to buy back the block. We have to, attract the working professionals, the entrepreneurs back to the neighborhoods to increase the overall community aesthetic of the neighborhood, the actual community dollars that are generated within the community, and we have to start circulating them more. So owning is important. Revitalizing is important. Controlling the rents, attracting higher incomes, attracting businesses back, you know, and, you know, it, it also gives us more political leverage because when there's more income in that community, the politicians listen more. There's more tax dollars generated from that community. Um, there's more money for us to put behind political campaigns. And one thing that we really don't participate in that we need to is after we start rebuilding these communities and we create more entrepreneurs and we create more businesses that are successful and we have higher incomes in the communities, we need to do what everyone else does that we don't participate in all. That's lobbying. That means after the after the day an election happens from the time that politician steps foot in their, first, their office the first day till they get voted out. There's a lobbyist talking to them every day. Those lobbyists push the agendas of certain groups. And that's how a lot of legislation gets on the books. Okay, a lot of legislation gets presented before the Senate and before Congress. It's the lobbyists asking for these things. So that's something that we have to do collectively. We buy back the block, we build the community, and then we start lobbying or send lobbyists to the state, to Washington, to the city, to the county, city council everywhere, and we start pushing our initiatives. We start pushing what we want to see in the policing. We, want, we can't do that just by voting, unfortunately, and that's something that we have been kept in the dark about. Okay, so I'm not just lecturing. I'm actually doing these things, 
okay? Redevelopment, revitalization, small group investing, and crowdfunding. So this block is the block I bought in Fifth Ward, Houston, Texas, Liberty Road in 2013. This is what it looked like when I bought it, okay? There was an abandoned grocery store, some houses that were very run down, an old uh, hair salon, old barbecue restaurant that had been converted to a house actually. And it was full of drugs and prostitution. Now at that time, nobody was interested in this, in this area. It was the hood hood. Um, they were calling it the bloody nickel. <laughs> but I saw the potential for it. I saw the location, I saw the proximity to downtown and I was watching how redevelopment was happening in the city. And I saw redevelopment going counterclockwise around downtown. This was the last quadrant that had not been redeveloped. So I knew eventually gentrification was gonna start in Fifth Ward. So I bought the property, um, owner financed it, didn't have to use a bank because the guy, had owned, he, the guy had inherited this whole block from his dad. So I was able to give him 10% of the agreed upon purchase price, which was 450,000. So I sold some of my rental properties. And mind you, I had been an investor for 10 years. I started investing in 2008. So I was about, about eight years into investing at that point in time, five, five to eight years in. Um, so I was able to sell some of my rental properties and I um, took that money gave him 10% down and now I now own this whole block and I'm making payments to him every month um, on the property. And it was gener I, what I did was I cleaned it up some, I got rid of the drug addicts and the prostitutes. I closed the grocery store down uh, because they're just attracting the wrong type of uh, traffic. And then I started doing parolee housing. So I did parolee housing on it for about four years. And what I was doing was the felons that couldn't get housing anywhere else. I was allowing them to rent a single room for me for $350 with all bills paid. So that gave them somewhere stable to live so they can keep a job, uh, stay in compliance with their parole. And it worked out really well. They were like very uh, low issue tenants. A lot of them had trades. They were carpenters, electricians, plumbers. Um, so when anything went wrong, I would just drop materials off down there. They would fix it themselves. And it got to the point to where the parole office uh, basically had a waiting list uh, waiting for me to have vacancies to offer these people the opportunity to, to uh, have somewhere stable to live. Um, these were nonviolent offenders, of course. I didn't do any anybody that committed murder or armed robbery or anything. But yeah, so I did that. And then in 2016, 2017, um, I decided that it was time to do something else with the property because the, the group that built City Center, uh, Midway Development, announced that they had just bought 150 acres on the south end of Fifth Ward. And they were about to build another city center, another 150 acre mixed use development high-end hotels, restaurants, uh, everything is going to be right there on the south end of Fifth Ward, right on Buffalo Bayou. So at that point, another builder started building houses in Fifth Ward, and he was building them deep in the neighborhood without even listing them, without even completing them, they were selling. And so for me, there was a sign, okay, this is gentrification starting for sure. Um, and I couldn't figure out what he was selling them for because he didn't have them listed. Um, but I pulled some county court records and looked at the liens and I found out he was selling them for about $250,000. So this is deep in Fifth Ward where we're still saying it's the bloody nickel and we're still saying, you know, it's too high a crime and, you know, the school district isn't good yet, but the other communities are already starting to come in and buy, quietly buy it up. So for me, it was like, okay, this is my opportunity to try to step in and kind of control the narrative, at least on the block that I own. So my goal was to build houses that would attract the young working professionals out of the suburbs, the ones that can afford a $270,000, $280,000 house, but they're buying in Katy, Sugarland, or Humble, but they work downtown, right? And they're also gonna miss that value appreciation wave when that neighborhood gentrifies because they're in the suburbs where the, the, the values are pretty stagnant. They may grow 3%, 5% a year at most, okay? So uh, after about a year and a half, I was able to get my plan together. This is what I'm building. Um, so I'm building these, these are 1700 square foot homes, three bedrooms, two bath, uh, nice contemporary look. And, uh, my goal was to attract the black working professionals out of the suburbs and it's been working so far. Um, you see all five of these are built. They're all sold. The two in the middle are not complete, but they're already sold. And all five are occupied by young black working professionals. Um, as a matter of fact, the last house is, was purchased by uh, a, a young Bahamian couple that just got their U.S. citizenship in December and they have a baby boy. So it's pretty cool to see them coming to the neighborhood and they've bought in the right area because this area, the values are going to go up significantly. So that's one part of it. The other part of revitalizing the neighborhood is protecting the existing tenants and protecting the existing residents that have been there long term. 
the most vulnerable group of all of them is going to be the renters. So what I figured out after, you know, trying to spin my wheels and trying to figure out how I could impact them and save them, I realized that I should start targeting landlords because uh, this is another misnomer that we have in our community a lot. When we talk about real estate, we talk about generational wealth. Um, owning a bunch of real estate really isn't, doesn't create generational wealth. It creates financial freedom for you. If you don't instill in your kids the importance of owning those assets and how to take care of them, a lot of the kids uh, don't want anything to do with the properties because you've, you've, they've been given a silver spoon. They're, they're not used to working hard. And owning real estate is an, is an active role that you have to play if you don't have the right property management in place. Um, even if you do, some people just don't like having to make decisions about tenants and everything. So um, what, I, what I found is my niche is targeting old landlords, tired landlords who don't have anybody to pass the real estate down to. Okay, so this particular block that you see in this picture, um, these these two buildings in the front and all of these these small houses in the back, um, it's a total of eighteen houses and, and two buildings on Lions Avenue, which which is the business district, which was the business district of Fifth Ward before desegregation. So the first black movie theater in Houston is on Lions Avenue. Um, all of the black businesses from everything like we talked about earlier, the dry cleaner, the grocery stores, the barber shops. The lawyer's office, the doctor's offices, everything was on Lyons Avenue and Fifth Ward. Um, and so my goal is to bring some revitalization back, and this is the start of it. So this property was owned by a couple who was ready to retire. The kids did not want to take over the property. Some of these tenants have been in this property literally 20 years, okay? Um, a lot of them are older, uh, single uh, African Americans. Uh, all of them are black, actually. Um, some of them are. They, the, the age ranges from 28, there's one or two houses with 28, but the one that's 28, her mom actually lives in another house in the same, on the same property. Um, her aunt lives there as well. And then there's a, a 90 year old gentleman that's on dialysis. His 55 year old niece lives on the property. They both have two separate houses. So that kind of gives you an idea of the dynamic of this community. Now, when these landlords get ready to sell um, and they put this property on the market for sale, it's open to anybody, right? And most people that are in real estate, especially the ones that don't look like us, do not buy property to maintain the way of life of the tenant. They buy property to maximize their profit. So the first thing they do is they go in and buy these portfolios and they increase the rent significantly. And that inherently displaces everybody because the people that are there now are on fixed incomes. They can't afford to pay an extra four or $500 a month for the rent. The rents right now on this property or between five fifty to seven hundred dollars a month. So, although that's a lot of money, that's twelve thousand dollars a month that is generating right now. Somebody else would have come in and bought it and raise the rents just out of nothing other but greed and the, the capital, the capitalism that that we're all uh, taught as entrepreneurs and uh, real estate investors. For me, it was different. For me, it was like I want to maintain their way of life. Twelve thousand dollars a month is enough. That's one hundred and forty-four thousand dollars a year. That property makes enough it makes sense to just buy it and protect these tenants and not have to raise their rents. What makes it really good is it has the commercial property because the, most of the commercial is vacant. So I can increase the rental revenue by investing in the commercial and renovating that. So this is what the houses look like when I bought them. Now, like I said, these two houses right here were the houses where two of the tenants that have been there for 20 years have lived. Okay. If I wouldn't have done anything to the houses and left them looking just like that, those tenants would have been happy because they were all afraid of change. They were all afraid that negative things would have happened when someone else bought the property from the sellers and I actually closed on it back in March. This is what the property looks like now. Okay, so I went and cleaned it up. I did landscaping, added fresh paint. I put screens on everybody's windows to help with their electricity bills. I went inside some of the homes or almost all of the homes. I redid the flooring in the wet areas where the, the, the floor had dry rotted, like around the toilets, uh, the sinks. I replaced cabinets. Uh, put in new toilets, new flooring, um, yeah, and any other major repairs that needed to be done so that we wouldn't have any issues going forward. I fixed all of that. Um, all that started in March, and um, I finished that probably mid-April, late April. This is the commercial, one of the commercial spaces here. This was a, uh, this used to be a, a barbershop, 
and a soul food restaurant. Like, as it stands now, there is a barbecue restaurant leasing the, the space with the door all the way to the right. Um, I've been talking with that tenant, um, trying to figure out what we're going to do. Um, I want to help him increase his business. However, if he, if he does not want to uh, step up to the plate and be active in that, I really want to put another business in this place that is going to be dedicated, that's going to want to invest in themselves. And then I'm going to have, I'm going to leverage all of my resources to make sure that that business is, is successful. This is actually the concept for the building. This is what it's going to look like after it's done. So we're going to add a rooftop to it, um, make it something attractive. This is right in the curve, right off of Highway 59 on uh, Lyons Avenue. Um, that that uh, historically, the, the first historic uh, African-American theater that I was talking about is right up the street, uh, literally in the same block around the curve. Um, the Fifth Ward Redevelopment Corporation redeveloped an office complex there where the state senator has an office. There's a, a brand new college prep school uh, right at the intersection right up the street. So this little portion that we have uh, under under ownership now was the last portion that needed to be revitalized for that whole little area to come back to life. This is the other building. This building was built in 1925. The white building was built in 1920. This one was built in 1925. This is actually after we started some of the renovations. There was an old screened in porch on the front. Um, and you know we are going through the process of completely renovating this building. This is what it's gonna look like when it's done. Okay, so this is gonna be like a shared business space. So think of Airbnb, but for businesses, where if you need to lease a space for a day, have a meetup for a day, you can you can lease one of these rooms, you can lease the whole house. Um, if you wanna do, there, each room is gonna have its own theme. So if you wanna do photo shoots in there, or if you wanna you know, record videos for your podcast or, record a music video or a scene for uh, you know, independent film. You'll be able to do all these things in this house. And this is part of the, the collective project, the crowdfund, the Buy the Block project. So all that revenue goes to everybody that invests in it. Okay, so everything I just showed you is a part of the Buy the Block project. That is the crowdfund that I'm running right now. Um, I've raised a, a total of $643,000 from a total of about 1,100 investors. Let me see here. And let me see if I have any. I'll go to it. So this is the platform. It's on buytheblock.com. You can you can visit the platform. You can see more history about the project. This is my team. Notice my team. Notice what my team looks like for my new construction development. You see everybody in there from the real estate brokers to the builders, to the insurance company, to the preferred mortgage lender, to the investors that invest in the project. All in this picture. Okay. That's some of that under construction. These are those houses again just different angles of them. That's that's the office complex I was telling you about that was renovated. This is the African-American theater. I told you that uh, has been renovated recently with a partnership between Texas Southern University and the Fifth Ward uh, Community Development Corporation. That's another view of the commercial properties. This is what the inside of the barbecue restaurant looks like now. So all this is included in the crowd fund. This is a concept for the other space that's vacant, okay? These are adjacent parcels of property that uh, will be available for us to purchase. I'm actually in negotiations with this guy already to buy it, buy this property here. This one, um, the sellers aren't really interested in selling right now. So what I'm most likely gonna do is um, lease this property and use it for parking for the other commercial stuff here to make sure that we have adequate parking. Okay, and this is one of the most important things about this project. This big red center is the new mixed use development that's coming online, that's built by the same people that built City Center. These below are actual renderings of what's gonna be there. Okay, it's gonna be huge. Right now it's vacant land. See how close we are to downtown. This yellow circle is 0.75 miles from this mixed use development called East River. This star is where the By the Block project is. So literally less than a mile from this big mixed use, de mixed use development. If you know anything about any area that's close to big mixed-use developments, when gentrification starts, when those buildings are up, 
property values in this entire one mile radius will be extremely high. So that's another win for everybody that invests in the project. By you owning shares and actual, you actually own a portion of this real estate in this project, you, as the property value goes up, your share value will be going up, okay? Also, I didn't talk about this, but I'm taking the net revenue from the, from the project, okay? So the net rent, after we pay all the bills, okay, so after we pay all of the bills um, and all the rents in the bank that's left, I'm taking 40% of that and I'm dividing it up. And anybody who buys shares in this project will get uh, a, a check. You, you'll get a payment, a dividend paid out. Um, so what it equates to, is about a 3% dividend on your investment. And so when you think about shares, if you, if you own a share of Nike stock right now, you get a 1% dividend. So this is literally three times what you would get if you took the same amount of money and, and bought shares of, of Nike, okay? But in this case, you're buying shares of actual real estate and you're actually contributing to us re redeveloping, revitalizing, maintaining, and controlling our neighborhoods through buying back the block, literally, collectively. Um, and so, you know, that is what I'm doing in a nutshell. Hopefully that makes sense for you guys. And I will open it up for questions. Let me see. How you, okay. You may have to unmute yourself. If anybody has any questions, I can go to the chat and let's see. Does anyone have questions? Yes, I do. Okay. okay. I appreciate the presentation, Chris. Okay. Um, question about, uh, you know, the target area within Fifth Ward. Mm -hmm. are, you know, kind of just thinking about it in my memory bank, aren't there certain pockets within Fifth Ward that are having sort of cancer cells or, or, or what have you? Uh, are you familiar with those areas? And yes. Yes, that, 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 area, yeah, that area is Cashmere Gardens. That is north of the big Union Pacific Rail Yard. That is probably about four to five miles away from this area. So um, this this area is not impacted by that by that um, unfortunate situation, where that what, what happened over there was uh, what the railroads used to use to treat their wood ties that go under the railroad tracks was a chemical called creosote, and there's a crea a creosote a processing plant over there. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those chemicals seeped into the ground over years and it got into the water supply and it, it contaminated a lot of homes. And so a lot of people were in, in, you know, inducing this water, uh, I mean, ingesting this water um, that had that creosote in it. And so it caused a lot of, lot of issues. But you know, um, fortunately, this area was not affected by that part. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, yeah, you're right. I didn't talk about the exact number. So um, I took the, the total amount of the project. This, the, the appraised value of the, the uh, project is 1.3 million. Um, we bought it for 1.2. I bought it under, a little bit under value. And what I did was I took a big portion of that and I broke it up into little bitty shares, $50 shares. So it, when you buy a share, you, you, you're, you're buying a micro ownership percentage in this project. The minimum buy-in is five shares, which is $250. Okay, so for two hundred and fifty dollars, you now own a piece of this. The maximum you can invest is uh, ten thousand dollars, so that would be two hundred shares of ownership in the project. Um, one thing I didn't talk about either is the payouts. So after we talk about dividends, usually when you, when you invest in anything, you always want to know how liquid it is. That means how can I sell it? You know, because having something of value that you can't sell, you know, make, makes it hard to make that 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 value real. So what we're gonna do is once a year, I'm gonna get a new appraisal on the property. And once we increase the rental revenue and the property value is going up, the appraisals will come back with higher numbers. So whatever percentage of increase the property value has, that's a direct correlation to the increase in the share, um, uh, your, the share value that you have. So you get to participate in the real estate value appreciation, just like owning the whole property. And like I said, once a year, you'll be able to sell your shares if you want to cash in. Or you can buy more shares from people that decide they want to sell. Um, yeah, and that's how that, that process works. Does anyone else have questions? Hi, Chris. Hey, Janelle. 
Hey, so for those um, who have already invested, um, I actually have already invested. I know you mentioned at one point there would be a portal mm -hmm. to kind of provide updates and mm -hmm. give, um, you know, investors an opportunity to see details. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see where you are in that process. Yes. So we are, we are doing the beta testing for that right now. Um, it should be live by the last week of June, uh, July 1st at the latest. And yes, it will be an active portal. You also have a wallet on there where your dividends can be distributed into, into the wallet and you can choose to either reinvest them or have them deposited in your bank account. And yeah, so I will be pushing communications out, out through there bi-weekly. We, we will still do monthly emails, like an email newsletter with an update on the project. But yeah, those will be the ways of communication on top of you know my social media and everything else where I'm always accessible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, anybody else have questions? Do you have an estimate of what that looks like? A trend analysis estimate of property value increase. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the thing on that. I could present it, but is, since this is SEC regulated, I don't want to, and here's the reason why. If you look at the property values, uh, and any other area that went through gentrification. If you look at the Heights, if you look at the area by, by the old city center, which was Spring Branch, the property values tripled, like no less than tripled. In the Heights, you couldn't buy property for less than, I mean, yeah, you, nobody was paying more than $25,000 for a lot in the Heights in like 98, 99. Right now, you cannot buy a lot in the Heights for less than probably 250000 So for me to you put that in a trend analysis and say you're going to make a two or three hundred percent return would throw up a bunch of red flags. So I'd rather be conservative and just say, you know, study the trends in the city and you'll see the property values have gone up significantly. Um, if, if you would like for me to show you some of those trends on sidebar, I could. Um, I can even show you the values in fifth order right now. When I bought that first block in 2013, people would list lots for 18 to 20,000 and nobody would touch them. And right now it's hard to find a lot in fifth ward less than $40,000. So um, I would pre I prefer to under promise and over deliver. I'm 100% uh, confident that the property values will, will double or triple. Um, but I just haven't put that in writing because it's so sticky when you get with, when you deal with, with dealing with the government and the SEC and promising such high returns. So, um, it's not too late to invest. Um, you have until the end of the month, until June 30th to invest. What's next after the Lions project? Well, I have a few projects in the pipeline. I don't like announce, you know, I don't like counting my eggs before they hatch. So I have another big project in Fifth Ward. I have the property under contract now, and it's uh, a block or two away from the crowdfund project. And this project, in itself will increase the value of the buy the block project once it gets rolling. So um, can't announce it just yet, but hopefully by the end of the month, early next month, I'll be able to announce that. Um, but yeah, the Lions, Lions Avenue, there's still vacant lots on Lions Avenue. There's still another building adjacent that I was, like I said, I'm negotiating to buy. So there's still a lot more opportunity there. And um, if I if the crowdfund continues at the rate that it does until the end of the month, I'll have enough capital to actually buy some of those adjacent properties and include that in the crowd fund. So that means, you know, that'll increase everybody's value, everybody's dividends even more. How much to invest? The minimum is $250. Um, you, you can go to the website, buytheblock.com and look for the Fifth Ward Project and you can read through the details. It'll give you all the different investment levels. They go from 250 up to 10,000. What happens to the investment if you do not meet your $1.3 million target by months end? Oh, I do not have to reach the $1.3 million target. I already own the property. So what I did was I, I did a, um, a seller finance with this seller as well. So um, what we agreed to was for me to give them 50% at closing. And I closed in March. So I gave them $600,000. Some of that came from the people that already invested in the crowdfund. Some of it was my personal investment money. And then I had a private lender to bridge the gap so that I could close the entire project with the 600,000. The other half that's owed to the sellers is not due for two years. Um, in between, there's no mortgage payments. So all of the revenue from the rent every month 
we get to reinvest in the property, we get to put on the side, and we I get to use the payout dividends. In two years, the property value, even now, I could easily go back and refinance the property and pay the other $600,000 off. Just go to a bank because I'm only asking for 50% and it's bringing in $12,000 a month in revenue. So in two years, I will be able to refinance, pay off the other half, and then, you know, then the sellers will be completely out of the picture. Okay, Does anybody else have questions? All right. Well, if not, I put the link to the to the crowdfund um in the uh in the, the chat over there, but you can go to buytheblock.com. It's really easy. If you just have more interest in learning about real estate and trying to figure out if you want to get into real estate, uh, you can go to learnfromchris.com and I have several resources on there that you can use. You can learn about all the different ways to invest. I'll put this on. Okay, yes, this is recorded, and um, I will make sure that the Coco Collective gets the recording so that it can be distributed to everybody so you can watch it, share it, or whatever. I may actually upload it to my YouTube as well. I will be doing tours. Once this COVID crisis is over and it's safe to have people congregating, I will be doing tours, definitely, uh, to show all the activity going on, showing all the projects, showing the proximity to the big mixed use development. Um, it's one, It's a lot better when you can see it in person. Um, if you just wanna go buy the properties, you can also. Um, I'll give you the property addresses. 3204 Lions Ave. That's the crowdfund project, 3204 Lions Ave. It's in the chat. And then the new construction is 2507 to Shams. And you can literally see both of these from Highway 59 from the freeway. So it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, if you don't live in Texas, you have to Google map or just take a trip down here to see them, you know? <laughs> That's the only options I really have. Um, I mean, if you come down one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I mean, you, you can still look at the properties. But yeah, that's I don't have any other ways to do it just quite yet. There are tons of realtors here. How can you work with them? I think the most important thing for realtors to do is to bring bring buyers. I mean, that's that's what I need the most to continue the narrative, to continue to show proof that we can rebuild our own communities, that we can make them thrive again, and that we can have interest and create our own value appreciation. That, that's another thing that we that's that's a stigma stack that's a, that that values are stagnant or that values go down when black people move in. The only way values go down is when people stop buying at higher prices period so if you're talking about a predominantly white neighborhood and a few black people move in when they say the values go down they just mean that more white people don't want to move to that neighborhood so no one else is offering more than asking price for houses okay but if we have our own neighborhoods and every time somebody comes in there's high demand for that neighborhood and somebody's paying two thousand three thousand four thousand more for the next house that's how you trend the values up and as long as we start doing that in our own communities, we no longer have to worry about that, that stigma of values being depreciated in black communities. It's, it's a false narrative and it, it, can, be, it can be controlled uh, by us continuing to buy. So we need realtors sending their clients to these neighborhoods to continue to buy. All right, anybody else have questions? Do you, do I, I definitely work with home builders. Yes, I do. Um, as a developer, I have two different guys that are building for me right now. I don't actually build the houses myself. I hire builders. I believe that it's important that everybody stays in their lane. When you get greedy and try to play all the roles, you, you, you waste a lot of time, energy, and effort. And it's a lot better when you can leverage and work with one small group, uh, one small group of people that each one plays their position. So I definitely work with builders. Um, if a builder in a different area needs help with a full development, like starting from scratch, I'll, I'll be, I'm willing to work with them on that as well. So yeah, definitely do that. Am I looking here? Yeah, okay, two questions at the same time. Outside of Fifth Ward, there's tons of opportunity. I'm, I'm open to looking at other opportunities. Um, there's other areas of the city like Acres Homes, like Sunnyside, parts of Third Ward um, that are prime for redevelopment that are historically black as well. 
um, I, I'm just focused on Fifth Ward because of the upside potential. Like, never again will there be a new 150-acre mixed-use development on Buffalo Bayou right next to downtown be built in Houston. So this is the prime market to be in. This is where it's a no-brainer. Values will definitely appreciate a significant amount over the next few years, and there's still a lot of opportunity over here. So that's why I'm focused on that neighborhood. Okay, anybody else have questions? Can I drop my info? Okay, yeah, so let's see. My social media is, Instagram is my main platform that you can follow me on. It's investor. Um, if you want to email me, you can email me at chris at learnfromchris.com. Thanks, Keisha. <laughs> Appreciate it. Are you familiar with any successful crowdfunding efforts headed by other African Americans? Um, actually, there's very few. Um, Jay Morrison had the Tulsa Real Estate Fund that, where he just closed the opportunity to invest with. Um, I know of a few others that have been talking about doing crowd funds. I haven't actually seen any big projects come online yet. Um, so I kind of feel like, you know, I'm kind of like a pioneer or a guinea pig, one of the two trying to get it done, but it's, it's working very well. And I, I'm hoping that people that have been thinking about it and, and watching what I'm doing actually take the step to actually launch their funds because I can't do it all on my own. Every city, had a black Wall Street, even though they don't talk about that. Every city had a black business district. Um, so, you know, we need to be bringing all of those areas back to life, all of those historically black neighborhoods. And crowdfunding is a way to do that. Anybody else have questions? You're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, well, that's it, guys. I will end the conference. I appreciate everyone tuning in. And again, you know, if you need to reach out to me, if you have questions, please feel free to follow up with me, email, Instagram, however, uh, visit the platform, share the platform, the buy the block platform with anybody that you think may have interest. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone hopping on.